Good morning, I'm Aya Wimala, and today is September 21st. We are finally getting a little bit more cool weather. Some, a lot of leaves, but they've been falling from the trees for quite a while. We even had rain last night. I don't know if it helped our, our rather drought conditions here, but it did rain for some hours over over the night in a gentle gentle enough way that it shouldn't have run off very much so that's a good sign that we're getting some rain uh, we're not as bad as the west coast and some of those the areas areas where the forest fires are but it's we've definitely been officially in a drought so hope, hope we're nearing the end of that um, I miss seeing you on Sunday. I had all intentions. I had my tripod and the book we're reading from and took them with me to Racine where I stayed overnight at the Eco Justice Center. So I'll, I'll put this online. I you probably, I don't know if this is backwards or not, but the Eco Justice Center is in Racine, Wisconsin. And it's just about, I would say maybe it's a less than a 10 minute drive from um, the Siena Center where I have done so many retreats, uh, moving into silent, silence retreat since 2009 or eight. And um, some of the nuns, the Dominican nuns, started the Eco Justice Center and it's a beautiful farm and they have all kinds of educational programs about the ecology and how individuals can help help turn the world around and they've been doing it for a long time so they're very well known and they invited me they had their discovery days which is a fundraising fair they have every year and it was over the weekend and the nuns of the event programmers at the Siena Center, uh, when the director of the program had asked if they knew anyone who might be able to lead walking meditation for part of the Discovery Days, they had recommended that they contact me, which is was wonderful to know that they did that. So uh, we had two groups, two meditation groups. The first one filled up really quickly, so they added an earlier one. So I was with that first group when it was time to do my recording with you. And uh, then the next group started after that. And it was wonderful. There was a lot of uh, uh, excitement about having the walking meditation there and people were really interested and we were able, they have a beautiful stone labyrinth, but it was in the hottest, it was really in the open sunlight. So that was part of our walking meditation. But we started out in a beautiful area in front of the farmhouse there with lots of uh, tables for people to sit and just relax and have picnic lunches. Or uh, We gathered there, started out there, and then we walked by, we were really close to the alpaca. Uh, they have alpacas, they have four that they've had a long time. And they have a new group that they're gradually, uh, they're separating the, the lot. They have a large enclosed area for the alpacas right at the front of the uh, property. And they're so beautiful. I, ha I just hadn't been that up close to alpacas in a long time. And they're just silky and beautiful. And each one has a distinct personality. So they had alpaca yoga. Uh, on Sunday morning. They had, I think, one or maybe two groups of the yoga. And so I found a beautiful uh, pathway, a nice big wide pathway that went to what they call the medicine wheel, uh, healing gardens. And it's a Native American, but sounds very Buddhist, doesn't it? Uh, a garden with all kinds of healing herbs and medicinal plants and uh, that made a beautiful circle for us to walk around and then we could, we were right up next to the alpacas and the alpa alpaca yoga going on so we got to see that vicariously we got to uh, enter that experience 
And then there was a nice long down one entire side that ran uh, the whole length of the alpaca enclosure that was uh, mowed and we could walk that path for a straight path and then turn around and come back and went around the, the uh, medicine wheel garden and then we walked through the, the woods and went to the um, stone labyrinth and everyone also had an opportunity to do that. So I met a lot of wonderful people, the volunteers there and the staff and they have college interns who live in the farmhouse when they're, when they're there. And uh, I, was a, I was able to stay in a little cottage, like it was like a grand kuti, a meditation cottage. It had a screened in porch and a little kitchen air, kitchen and um, that was just set in the woods, very close to the farm building. That was a, a little mini retreat for me. But uh, everyone there was so wonderful. And they have goats and guinea fowl and uh, chickens and alpacas and cats, lots of cats, and a big barn and an education building with places where they can do indoor workshops. And they're teaching people how to take care of the land and how to take care of their, uh, their, their gardens and different ways to grow things and different, I mean, it's just a fantastic place. And there was someone I had to leave before I, I got to see it who did a workshop on um, uh, a demonstration on a, the spinning wheel. And I'm sure she was using alpaca wool. And people were selling things and there were lots of uh, alpaca wool caps. And my friend Marty said that the alpaca wool is just incredible. She has alpaca gloves, mittens, that she treasures. So the alpaca yoga was quite different from what I expected. The alpacas are really tall animals. They don't, they're, they're slender, but I couldn't imagine them walking on the yoga group. But they, the four of them who've been, at, been there very long uh, are, must be very comfortable with it because they're right in the field with the, they were about in the first group, maybe maybe 10 or 12 people in that yoga class and they had the teacher had some music and the alpacas just came in and made themselves right at home close to the people close to the fencing and they had been standing watching us as we were doing walking meditation but when the yoga group came two of them were were uh, lying down on their backs looked like cats stretching and uh, savasana pose. They were so comfortable. They were right there with that group, but they are on their backs, just in the most luxurious poses, enjoying every minute of it. And then one was uh, sort of walking around and close to them, but not bothering anybody. And uh, another one was sitting down and uh, on the other side of the yoga people. So it it looked it looked they were. No harm was being done to the animals or the people, and it looked delightful. And it was, uh, the whole experience for me was beautiful. A little bit reminded me of a little mini mainstay, just that uh, meditating out in nature and with these, with people, all the people there and coming to the fair, you know they, they all, I just, you could feel the good intentions coming from people and the metta coming from people. An amazing, uh, the, everyone was so friendly. And I got to meet some of the nuns who have been connected with it, well, from the very beginning. And they're still, they're still there helping out and uh, they must be very proud of the, what they've created there. So it was only an hour and a half from Crystal Lake or an hour and 20 minutes. So. It's open and people can come and just do a self-guided tour and go around and see things, or you can go for a program. It says the grounds are open seven days a week and uh, it, it's worth, it's certainly worth the drive. And it's very close to the Siena Center, which is right on the lake. 
and I will put this up on my Facebook page. So, um, a true delight in being in nature and walking and doing that walking meditation is just feels like a perfect thing to do. Especially, I mean, these days it's it's it has so it has so many other values. I think even healing values for us that we don't think of ordinarily. <clears throat> so uh, on October 17th, I'm going to be doing a program with a local therapist, and we're going. To, it's going to be an outdoor meditation. So I'll let you know about that too. We we just picked that date uh, yesterday. So now, let's get back to our trip, to our pilgrimage. So our own trip. Now we're on day 15 of 35. So we have, uh, last time we met, we talked about the reading was a handful of leaves and the reflection was advice to Rahula. That's the Buddha's son who came to be a little monk with him the age of uh, I think six or seven and today we're, we're on day 15 and the reading is a rainless cloud we study this it's this is from the Itibhutaka 75 and that's one of the smaller books of the Tipitaka but uh, it's it's very uh, it's very good. It has a lot of, a lot of things in it. Some shorter teachings, typically. A rainless cloud. The Buddha said, there are three kinds of persons in the world. What three? One who is like a rainless cloud. One who reigns locally and one who reigns everywhere. Those are the three types. The one who is rainless, the one who reigns locally, and the one who reigns everywhere. What kind of person is like a rainless cloud? A certain person never gives to anyone. This person does not give food, drink, clothing, garlands, incense, medicine, lodging, or lamps to ascetics, the poor, or the needy. This kind of person is like a rainless cloud. What kind of person rains locally? A certain person gives to some, but not to others. He gives food, drink, clothing, garlands, incense, medicine, lodging, and lamps, only to some ascetics and to some of the poor and the needy, but not to others. This kind of person reigns locally. What kind of person reigns everywhere? A certain person gives to all. This person gives food, drink, clothing, vehicles, garlands, incense, medicine, <clears throat> lodging and lamps to all ascetics and to the poor and the needy. This kind of person reigns everywhere. These are the three kinds of persons in the world. And the reflection, and we can all sit and be in meditation posture and just let this be a reflection. Let it bounce around in your mind if you like, or it might you might want to just listen to it and then let it go and just sit. But you can sit with it and let it sink in and see. It's a it's a, a it's a little severe, but it's about the world. It's from the Majjhima Nikaya 82. So that those are the middle length discourses in number 82. The four Dhamma summaries. The world is swept away. It does not endure. The world offers no shelter. There is no one in charge. 
the world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The world is insufficient, insatiable, and a slave to craving. So that summarizes what this physical world, this world of samsara, sums it, this sums it up. So it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be depressing, it's just a real, realistic state, statements. The world is insufficient, insatiable, and a slave to craving. That we probably all see and experience and uh, are working on all the time to not be that's when we talk about not being part of this world but living in the world living fully but seeing it for what it is so why don't we sit It's a contrast, isn't it? That reading, the reflection, and uh, my description of how much I enjoy being out in nature and being at the Eco Justice Center. It seems it appears to be a contrast, but I think they're both exactly uh, can be saying the same thing. So We can make choices about being in nature and being uh, finding beauty in nature and finding peace in nature. So appreciating this world, but realizing this world is also has it's insatiable and craving, craving rules. No one else is in charge. So we have to create our own way of being in the world. And it's out there. It's it's out there for us. A, a way, of, a way of simplicity and renunciation and goodwill. And metta, loving kindness and harmlessness. And when we find people who also embrace that, it's it's a joy to be around them. So, why don't we sit? Lift your spine up, even if you, you might be on your back. You could be walking right now or sitting or sitting on the floor. But feel your spine lifting up. It just, it feels good. It gives your lungs more room to breathe. And it gives you a really good way to support yourself. Let your, let your spine lift you up and support you and you can relax. and work with your own body. Now with each exhale, just in your normal breath, let go. As you exhale, just relax, let go.
you can be aware of everything. With your eyes closed, we still see light. We still see some images, usually on the inside of our eyelids. We hear sounds. They're totally redoing the asphalt uh, parking lots at our apartment complex. So you may hear a lot of those sounds even coming in through the closed door. You can you smell, you pick up fragrances or just smells. We have the contact that our skin is making, our body is making contact with so many things, the clothes we have on, our feet on the floor, whatever we're sitting on, we feel the firmness. We have contact with our own body as we're hands may be placed palms up or palms down in our lap. If you have a breeze blowing up over you, the air brushing your skin, And our mind is one of our senses. And we usually experience that with our thoughts. So let your, your thoughts arise. Don't try to hold them back. Don't try to judge them or think, oh, that's not the right thought to have right now. Just be aware of the thoughts arising we don't control that, but you can control your attitude towards them. You can decide if you're going to pay attention to them or start creating stories from a thought, which we do so quickly. Or if you're just going to notice there's a thought and let it come you might make a note of the kind of thought it is. But then just let it go. Don't get caught up in it. Don't begin uh, analyzing your thoughts. Just allow them to come and allow them to go. And once your mind has become calm, and it may not be right now, it may take, may take longer. When your mind becomes a little calmer, imagine that it's a pond and it starts out kind of muddy, lots of things jumping around in the pond, little turbulence from wind blowing across the top. And what we want to do is see our mind like that pond. And as we slow down, and allow our minds to relax and our bodies to relax, that's very important. Our pond just becomes uh, smoother on the surface and everything 
in that pond begins to settle down to the bottom. And eventually it can become very clear. And when that pond becomes clear, our ability to see things more clearly arises. All of that stuff that gets in our way has settled down. we can begin to see other things rising within us and see them more clearly. We may feel fear. We may feel anxiety arise, or we may feel like we've been living with anxiety for a long time. And it's okay when they arise. It's good for us to see these things. We don't want to keep pushing them away from ourselves. We don't want to keep pushing them down into the muddy, muddy pond, hoping they'll just go away that way. They won't. When those things rise up that we don't like about ourselves or that we're uncomfortable with, It's okay to look at them and see them clearly. Lots of times we need to make them our friends so we can talk to them. Do you, what are you afraid of? Why are you worried? Think of these feelings, these dark feelings that you're uncomfortable with. Think of them as a little you, a little dear, precious child. Ask that, ask that fear or that anger or that anxiety to just come and sit by you and put your arm around yourself. Just imagine a little you. and see if you can comfort yourself that way. Help yourself relax. Breathe in and breathe out. Know that the fear, the worry, the anxiety is just a part of you. Just that something that is hard to address. But if we hide it in the dark, if we push it down, we never get to work with it. Or it comes up in inappropriate times. It comes up 
when we least expect it and we can't work with it. We can make peace with these difficult emotions and making peace with them and following and following the precepts and the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. They're just a, that's a wonderful way to work with, work with all of those little parts of ourselves. Make peace with ourselves and allow those things that hold us back and create suffering, allow them to go, allow them to go away. Allow them to become manageable. It comes from doubting ourselves. A lack of confidence is one of the hindrances. So you can put your arm around your little self that's full of doubts or full of fear or anxiety. And I like to call it this thing, they're there, they're there. <laughs> comfort, comfort that part of yourself. It's not permanent, it's not gonna last, it's not who you are. then it's okay to let it go for a while. It, it will come back. It takes a lot of mastery to, to work through all of our, all of our unfinished business or all of our um, insecurities or our lack of belief in ourselves. It takes a long time. We don't have to be working on it every second. But you can sit with yourself any time and comfort yourself, encourage yourself. And that can be, if you have five or ten minutes to practice, that's a good, that's a good way to practice. And when you practice metta, think of it the same way. When you're practicing metta and you begin with yourself, you're sending yourself that comfort, that encouragement, those good wishes and blessings, those are encouragements for us. And do that first. And learn how to do that metta practice for yourself so you know how it can feel for others. So our time is way over. Uh, so thank you. May everything you do, may everything all of us do or say or think today be done for our own benefit. May we be aware that it's also being done for the benefit of all other living beings. See you Thursday. Have a beautiful day.